So good evening, everyone. Good evening to the people in Israel. Good morning or afternoon to the Americans. I'm Sigal Yaniv Feller. I'm Deputy Director of GFN Israel. Um, and we're really happy for all of you um, that you were able to join us tonight. Over the past months, it seems like it's almost a year now since the COVID outbreak and its direct impact on the social organizations all over the world and in the US and Israel, of course, we've been increasingly hearing the world merger in relation to nonprofits, um, in relation to grantees, and uh, as an option that might be relevant for funders to explore, especially as a way to try to um, mitigate the different challenges that uh, were posed by COVID and that the nonprofit sector has been facing. It, was, uh, it felt like a kind of buzzword that more and more funders have been approaching us about and with curiosity what it really meant and what it might mean to them. Um, so over these months, more and more funders have picked up the phone and emailed and asked us, what are we doing about uh, mergers? Have other funders been involved with mergers in the nonprofit sector? And that led us to create the program that we're offering today. Um, what we're going to focus on today is a global perspective on mergers. So it's not locally only to Israel or only to the US. Um, and try to focus on what it really is, what it might look like, and what roles philanthropy might play in mergers in the social sector. This isn't about if you should initiate a merger, and it also isn't about how to do so in case you do wish to. So it's not a practical guide to how to run a merger. That's not what you're gonna leave today with, although you should be able to leave the session today with a much better understanding about the issue, its complexity, sensitivities, and different perspectives. A successful session in our eyes isn't necessarily if all of you run out of the session today and start uh, exploring how to merge nonprofits you're in touch with. That's absolutely not the case. On the contrary, if out of this session today, some of you leave it and say, now I understand what this is about, and I'm absolutely not gonna be engaged with a merger, that might also be a really good success for us, because you know much more about it, you know under, and understand how sensitive and complex it is, and because of that, you're not gonna explore it. So it's in no means are we promoting necessarily doing a merger, but we're trying to offer a much uh, better understanding of what it is and what it might look like and what the role of philanthropy is. So what do we have planned for today? We're gonna to start with a presentation by Professor Donald Hader, who I'll introduce in a minute, um, and a short conversation with him following his presentation. Then we're gonna have a panel discussion with two case studies that we'll share with you about mergers that took place in the social sector with um, a distinct role that philanthropy played in them. And then if time permits, we're gonna break into two breakout groups and in a smaller setting, we'll have the opportunity to explore, engage a little bit into a peer consultation or a peer learning and the opportunity for you to bring challenges if you have or to further explore different examples you were presented with during the meeting today. So a few technical remarks before I uh, introduce Professor Hader. First of all, if you have the questions during um, Professor Hader's presentation and later on during the panel part, please use the chat. Um, you can put as many questions as you want in there and we'll forward them later um, and present them to Professor Hader at the end of his presentation. Um, if you can, please leave your camera open. It's always nicer for speakers to speak um, and feel that they're speaking to live people. Um, please put your mic on uh, mute. Um, during the presentation, and if you haven't so far, please put your name on the screen um, during the presentation. So I want to jump straight to it and I'll introduce Professor Hader. We're very excited to have uh, you tonight with us, Professor Hader, and thank you for joining us. Professor Hader is a graduate of both Stanford and Columbia universities. He's a faculty member at the Kellogg School of Management, the Center for Nonprofit Management. Um, he's been over many, many years involved with research and with teaching, focusing mainly on the management of public and nonprofit organizations, public finance and economic development. Um, going through his bio, he went through every sector that uh, we usually talk about, the business sector, the governmental sector, the nonprofit sector and philanthropic, involved with various boards and charities. And recently, and that's the reason why we invited Professor Hader with us tonight, is that he conducted a large scale survey about mergers in the nonprofit sector with many case studies um, from the US, which I think the, the lessons learned from them are relevant um, globally to different uh, funders around the world. So um, I think we'll stop there and uh, hand it over to Professor Hader. Um, thank you, and I'll mute myself, and the floor is yours. Thank you. 
and it's a real privilege to have this opportunity to talk to you about my research and, and my, my practical experience. I opened up the papers this morning <clears throat> to look at what major newspapers were saying about the not-for-profit sector and charities. And we have this in common. We're all dealing with the problems of funding. We're dealing with the problems of core team. We're dealing with the problems of how to deliver services. And I just, for your reference, the Wall Street Journal has a little story on how foundations are adjusting to the coronavirus. <clears throat> There's New York Times story on Bill Gates and the Gates Foundation and how it's preparing to distribute vaccines to 150 countries around the world working through public-private partnerships. So <clears throat> our discussion today on, on mergers is just simply to talk about a tool, a tool in your toolbox, your toolkit, when you're thinking about how to make a not-for-profit organization and your funding more successful, better able to achieve results, and better able to deliver more mission. So let me be <clears throat> begin, pardon me, by saying a few things about myself that Chagall asked me to, 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 <clears throat> to put into perspective. I've been 43 years on the faculty at Northwestern, but I've had time out for public service. I've had time out to work in the private sector. I've served on 35 different boards of public and not-for-profit and for-profit organizations. I've been at the executive office of the president, and I've been the chief financial officer of the city of Chicago. So I come at this with some practical experience as well as my academic research. We got into the business of looking at mergers here in Chicago because our major foundations were being overwhelmed by requests for funding due to the recession in 2008 and later the shortfalls in funding from the state of Illinois. The research was modeled along the lines of other cities that had done work along this line in Los Angeles, in Boston, Philadelphia, uh, Minneapolis, uh, they all looked at what was going on in the mergers of not-for-profits in their communities. And uh, ours was kind of special because we picked out 25 mergers that occurred between 2004 and 2014 that cut across a variety of not-for-profits, everything from literacy to hospice to uh, job training to social services. We did not look at hospitals because hospitals are kind of a unique industry with their own dynamics and their own set of forces. But we looked at a good variety. These organizations were in size in American dollars of a couple hundred thousand dollars up to a hundred million. They included two uh, national associations or organizations, the Girl Scouts of America and their uh, mergers here in the Midwest and United Way, uh, which is one of our largest uh, fund funding organizations in the charitable sector in the United States. And we looked at the, the consolidation of, uh, of uh, those units in the Chicagoland area. So it was a comprehensive study. It was qualitative and quantitative. We asked, uh, we interviewed over 100 people for the 25 organizations we looked at, both the acquired and the acquirer. We asked them at the various stages of their merger prior to merger, their discussions, during the merger negotiations, what were they looking at, and then post-merger. Out of that, we found that 88%, 22 of the 25 organizations felt the merger had a positive impact. They were better able to deliver their mission, they were more financially stable, and they were able to achieve their goals. This was both for the acquired and acquirer. So there was some success here, okay? Now, let's look. Scott, I'm sorry to interfere. Tell us if you want us to share your presentation while we're speaking or if you want to do it yourself. Um, go ahead. We can start with a view of the not-for-profit and I, I, will, I will direct you as to. Okay, Ruth, will you share it? Yeah, go ahead. So, first of all, mergers. When I say mergers, some of you probably had experience with mergers, some of you have not. Um, in the private sector, the connotation a merger is usually a win-win strategy. Other than a hostile takeover, both sides work together to achieve a mutual end. In the not-for-profit world, there usually the feeling was that uh, the view of not-for-profits is that a merger was a failure. It was a recognition that the board and the funders had not achieved their mission, had not achieved their objectives. Most of the mergers that we saw occurring occurred for two reasons, financial failure or financial shortcomings, or one of the leaders, the executive director or president or whatever title it might be, retires or leaves the organization. 
and very few very few mergers do we see really had a strategic component to it. <laughs> well, <clears throat> pardon me, that view is that view has changed because of the research that has been done both on both coasts and what we ourselves found out that many more mergers were strategic. Now, the first slide you see up is called the collaboration matrix. Okay, matrix is simply a spectrum. Okay, and it's a way of looking at the relations of not for profits. Not for profits get their funds or resources from the outside. They get them from funders like you, they get them from the government, they have multiple sources, but they don't get them in a typical corporate way through equity and debt. And so they have to grow. We call this usually the collaborative sector, the not for profit sector, the civil society. Uh, but it's that these organizations have to work with one another. So the spectrum is simply a way of looking from one end to the other end of organizations of how they cooperate, collaborate, partner, and eventually sometimes merge. And so we show this on a spectrum. Rarely do you see organizations just jump into a merger. My colleague, uh, Jim Austin at Harvard, uh, often talks about the collaboration challenge as being analogous to a dating uh, apparatus. You have one date, you go steady, you might live together, you might get married. It's, it's steps, it's, it's, a, it's a progression along the way. And so uh, for most not-for-profits, partnering or collaboration is their number one tool. They usually begin with sharing information, sharing best practices, but along the way can be doing programs together with other organizations, forming alliances with organizations, joint ventures, back office operations and consolidations, and eventually a merger. So I want you to hear just to get a sense of this spectrum that is merger is just one of the options. It's usually the last option after these others have been used along the way. So we don't begin with a merger. We usually begin in the collaboration matrix with other forms of working, working together. So that is essentially, we, we usually talk about that in terms of restructuring an organization. And when you restructure an organization, the question you have to ask is what is the problem we're solving? Merger may not be the right solution for that particular problem. So we've got to be quite specific. What is the problem to even raise the question of, of, of merger? One more thing about the collaboration matrix is you move from one side to the other. It is built on the context of give to get. If you're going to get something for your organization, you're going to get more resources. You're going to get access to broader networks. You're going to get access to new geographic territory to serve. Is that you have to give something up. And so as you move along that matrix, it's give to get, is that you, you, you go through a restructuring process that may be your board, it may be your structure of the organization, it may be your mission. Next slide, please. So moving collab collaboration matrix, I move to merger characteristics. What do we mean by a merger? Okay, if we can go to the next slide. Um, we mean by a merger combinations uh, of organizations uh, where there's a change of control and usually a change of structure. Okay, so as we move along mergers, it can be organization A joins with organization B to form organization C, or A and B go together and A dissolves into B. It can be change in management controls of a management contract uh, where one organization manages several others. So every merger is different, okay? And uh, it is important to understand that these, each merger is different and, and they may differ in each of the subsectors of the not-for-profit world. For example, we had mergers uh, going on of hospice operations. Why? Because the Affordable Care Act in the United States changed the magnitude of insured population and delivery of health care services, whereas hospice could no longer just be a cottage industry. It had to be bigger. It had to be larger. It had to serve uh, more, uh, uh, more patients. And, and so the merger was driven by factors within the industry. The adoption industry changed in the United States as uh, international adoption agencies that had access to orphans that were being adopted from Russia, as Russia closed its borders and hence 
changed the supply and demand for orphans and forced a consolidation among uh, adoption agencies. So each industry that we talk about uh, that in our study had different dynamics and, and therefore each merger was different. Now here's a key point to thinking about mergers, okay? Mergers are usually of two types. They are either you're pooling your resources or you're trading your resources. Think of a hospital that goes together with other hospitals and they say, let's go together and buy our medical supplies and buy our cleaning and our equipment and let's do this together so that we are able to drive a better bargain and a better, uh, a better cost structure for what we're doing. Well, that's a pooling of resources. That leads to greater efficiency, presumably. It leads to economies of scale. So many not-for-profits that are in the same industry, same business, serving the same clientele, is that pooling may be very advantageous. On the other hand, we found a number of not-for-profits that traded their resources. For example, one of the organizations we looked at was in disability services. Um, and one organization had technology. They had access to computers and computer training for people that were disabled that could um, be utilized to make them productive and to get them employable. We had another disabled disability organization that had residential facilities for people who were disabled to house them as an alternative to the state taking over. So these were two organizations. One has housing, one has tools and access to computers. They merged, they traded what each of them had to become a larger organization, serve more population, and provide a broader scale of services. So most mergers we found in the not-for-profit either were pooling or trading. Next, uh, next slide, please. Um, just a couple of the key issues in mergers that I wanted to go over and some of the success factors. These are, these are quite common and you're, I noticed uh, Chagall gave me uh, access to your handbook for Jewish Funders Network that was on a handbook on collaboration. And most of these are right in your collaborative uh, handbook that uh, you should have access to. But the key issues really is how do you find the right partner, okay? And in our study, 80% of the organizations that merged had prior mergers. They had prior experience. 60% worked, knew the other organization. The acquired and acquirer had knowledge or information about one another. Now the partner might be somebody that's had the same mission, say the same geographic area, may provide the same service. Due diligence became a big issue. Some of our organizations had bad debts that had not been written off. Some of them had antiquated facilities uh, had deferred maintenance that was going to be a huge cost. Some of them had legal risk because they dealt with children and uh, potentially uh, had long tail liability for uh, suits brought by parents. Some of them had succession issues, both succession on the board, which members of the board would go on and serve in the new organization, which ones would go off, which ones we had cases where we had two CEOs, which and both of them wanted to be head of the organization. How do you pick between them? And finally, key support is board support. In all our successful mergers, we found that there was board support. And where there was board opposition, there was likely to be a failure of merger. Most important factors, trust. That comes up time and time again. Do you, does the acquirer and acquired, do they trust one another? And trust building is a very, very difficult process because people are threatened, they're gonna lose their jobs, Funders are going to have a potential regret because of their efforts are going to be lost in the merger. Uh, we've had a number of cases of what we call uh, buyer's remorse, that people really didn't make the right choice and who they partnered with. So trust is important. Purposeful is just simply to say that there's clarity in your merger. You both sides write down what they want to achieve, and each of them recognizes what the other wants out of the merger process. Board chair is always important. Whoever is head of your board has to be an advocate or a proponent of the merger because without it, it's not likely to work. And finally, knowing your partner is key. Do your homework. Know the other organization in and out. Let me turn then to findings for funders. Part of our study that was sponsored by eight foundations in Chicago is they wanted feedback 
they wanted to know um, exactly what they should be doing and how to do it better. So if you would move to findings for funders. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Findings for funders. And this is really important. And that is that there's transparencies of policies and practices. Um, many of the funders weren't very clear how they handled mergers. Um, some of our organizations said, oh, I don't want to tell my funders that I'm thinking of a merger, they'll cut off my funding. Um, or some of them assumed that if organization A was getting $25,000 a year from a funder and organization B was getting $25,000 a year from a funder, that together they'd get $50,000. When the policy of the, of the funder, the philanthropist or the foundation, was we give no more than $25,000 to any one organization. So be clear in your practices. Collaborate with one another. Work together as funders when you're working on a merger. It's always more successful if there's more parties in there that are blessing the outcome. Your engagement as a broker, facility, facilitator, investor in the merger process is important. As Chagall said in the introduction, we have a number of mergers that didn't work out because the funders were not cooperative or belligerent or tried, were too heavy in their tactics and engagement. Uh, so what is the right balance? And each merger requires a different funder to play a kind of a different role here as broker, facilitator, investor, and so forth. And then patience, 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 patience. These mergers, at least in the United States, took upwards of over a year to culminate. They were expensive. In most cases, funders donated money to pay the legal costs or they gave money to support a third party uh, uh, broker or a third party consultant to help with the merger. We had one case of a merger that took five years to culminate and talk about patience. So let Don, me- Don, do you want us to move back to the, you, you skipped over one slide about the mergers, why uh, did fail? Mergers fail. This comes right out of the literature of uh, merger failure in the private sector. Whereas if you ask most corporations that merge with another corporation, why they fail? And the number one issue is culture, culture, culture. The cultures didn't mix. One was entrepreneurial, another was bureaucratic. One was very political, the other was uh, very meritocracy, meritorious, mer based on merit. So uh, uh, the culture is, becomes very important. Uh, why these things fail is boards, staff, CEO. We had one merger that unraveled a year later because one, we had two CEOs, one became board chair and the other became, or one became chairman and the other one became CEO and they fought like dogs and cats and they decided both boards that they would unravel their merger a year after it happened. Weak purpose and, uh, and clarity. In other words, do we have a strategy for this merger? It's, it's simply survival is not likely to work. We're merging two failed organizations. Well, you merge two failed organizations, you're gonna get a third failed organization. So what is the strategy here? What, what is behind, what do you get, hope to get out of that? And bad structure and, and bad governance. Uh, a number of organizations have, uh, have a mentality, well, it's our organization, uh, heads I win, tails you lose. In other words, we won't cooperate with the new organization, either the acquired or the acquirer. So the structure has to be congruent and the structure has to work out over time. Let me jump ahead, just find, go on for, uh, uh, takeaways for you, and then we can open up to questions. Um, I emphasize, and as Chagall said at the beginning, merger is a tool. It may not be the right tool for the problem that afflicts the organizations that you either fund or interact with. It's not a magical solution. Each merger is different. When we interviewed people, they all had their different characteristics, different industries, different behavior of individuals and different ways of working through how you put organizations together. A merger like a marriage is difficult. It requires a lot of conversation and a lot of communication. We found in our study that mergers as a, as a strategy for success, that mergers can be a powerful tool to achieve greater mission and greater impact. And that ought to be some preeminent in the minds of funders is that if 
merger can achieve these things and it's the right tool as the right time and the right organizations, then by all means pursue it. And finally, just as I ended with a previous uh, seminar we did um, uh, with you people, it was, uh, I said every board ought to consider a merger at some stage of their support of their organization. And so I leave you with every funder ought to consider the merger option or the merger tool at some stage in their support of their organizations that they work with and interact with. So with that, I simply tell you that it, it's, it's nice to have this opportunity to share with you. Um, again, I ended up my academic career working with not-for-profits and still work with not-for-profits. And I'm very proud to leave this legacy as a, uh, as a study that people can go back to and Chicago will provide you if you want to get it on the internet, the complete uh, merger as a strategy for success. Um, study that you can you can um, uh, download and, and work with uh, and I commend you on your own handbook for collaboration because mergers come in there too if you want reading of something that's immediate at home that you've given a lot of thought to so thank you and be happy to answer any questions you might have Right. Thank you so much, Don. Um, we already have some questions that I'll read out. And I'll also tell you that Reut will post in our chat in just a minute the link to our handbook for funder collaboration, which is also on our websites in both Hebrew and English. It was written a few years ago, but the tactics and the logic are the same. And it's a good starter about generally looking at the overview of how to develop a funder collaboration. And also we'll put the link to Professor Hader's research as well. Um, so first question we have over here. How can funders propose and encourage exploration of mergers by their grantees without seeming heavy-handed or over-invested in the outcome? Well, that is a very, very difficult question to answer. Um, and I think it comes out of what is the problem that you're dealing with in your organization and trying to sow the seeds of the, the organization, the leadership in the organization itself comes to a conclusion that restructuring is needed of some type, of which a merger is one of the restructurings that might be done. And what is the problem? We are, almost all of our mergers is the preeminent objective was greater growth. They saw that as the number one issue. How do we grow this organization? How do we find access to resources? How do we find access to more markets and clientele? How do we diversify our funding and able to, to, to capitalize on greater resources? So sowing the seeds of letting people in the organizations you interact with come to this conclusion themselves that they ought to uh, think about a merger rather than straight out hitting them over the head with the M word, which as I said, has a, in most not-for-profit communities has a very negative connotation, meaning failure. And what we tried to do in this study was saying, mergers can be lead to success and is a tool that can be used for success. Right, thank you. I'll read out another question and reminding you that if anyone here in the room has additional questions, please list them in the chat. What can funders bring to the table that no other stakeholder involved can bring to the table? Well, that's an excellent kind of question. Most obvious is you're bringing resources to the table that maybe other stakeholders don't. But understand that not-for-profits have a greater range of stakeholders than, let's say, a private corporation, because you have multiple funding options, you have government, you have the people you serve, your clientele, you have your board, you have your staff, uh, you, have your, uh, you have your executive leaders. So what funders bring is they bring a perspective. And that is, Funders usually are, have the benefit of seeing other organizations and their activity. They usually have a benefit of being able to benchmark and know who's doing a good job in what areas. And they can use their funds strategically to coach the organization, to bring it along, to help it make the strategic moves that will strengthen the organization. So I think they, you have this outside advantage that you bring to a uh, uh, restructuring of an organization and you know money can be used in a very positive way it can also have a very negative impact if the funder says if you don't do this we're going to withdraw our support and i've seen that backfire many times in 
potential in organizations that had a great potential for merger if they could just work through these problems themselves. So it's a subtlety that you're going to be required to have, uh, and there's no one straightforward answer. Be patient. Thank you. Okay, I have two more questions here. One is, do you see a difference if the, for the role of philanthropy if a merger is bottom up versus top down? Meaning if the nonprofits come up to the funders and ask them to assist in a merger that they initiate versus if the idea and incentive to create the merger is coming from the, from the philanthropic sector with the funder towards the nonprofits. One of the interesting things we found was the language that people used when we interviewed them. Um, they had a lot of terms different than merger. A union of equals, a, a partnering of, 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 of associates, um, a transfer of assets versus those that were having an unhappy experience with the merger. It was a cram down. It was a shotgun. Um, they had all kinds of terrible connotations that they attach to it. The bottom up top down issue is you should hope that the, both processes are going on. In our case, 60% of the mergers were the acquired organization approached the acquirer. It's usually the one organization, usually the weaker of the two, that is seeing strength by going to the acquirer and having enough sense that they could have something to offer the acquirer that might lead to a potential um, beneficial merger. So it's both top down and bottom up. The top down can be the board, it can be the funder, um, but usually it works best when it's the recognition of the organization and its members, its constituent parts, they realize that a merger might be an effective tool to be better enable them to achieve their mission and to grow. Great, and I have a, another question here on a different angle. Um, can you give advice for funders merging? So this is not the nonprofits merging, but the funders. For instance, for an issue area that does not attract a lot of funding, how would decision making work? Do all funders get board appointments, et cetera? So if, I'm not sure if you had examples like that in your research. No, but if you read the New York Times this morning, Warren Buffett talks about how he gave Bill Gates $33 billion to help <coughs> uh, the Microsoft Foundation and to help Bill Gates and the Gates Foundation achieve its objectives. Uh, because he said they had better expertise. They just understood better. We had one merger between two foundations in Chicago, Chicago Foundation for Women and the Eleanor Foundation. These were two foundations that had similar missions to support um, uh, impoverished women with children, to get them mainstreamed and to get them on their feet and enable them to be productively employed they were they talked for years um, and then finally one of them said you know what you can do a better job we will give you our assets and we're simply this merger is simply going to be an asset transfer we're giving you our resources and dissolving our corporation and merging merging with you and so i think the realization that maybe somebody can do it better or that together we're going to be more powerful if we use our resources for whatever reasons uh, is that we have more money, we have more leverage, we have more talent, we can reach more people. So uh, you're, doing, you're, you're seeing for the first time that foundations do come together. Of course, we have community foundations in the United States, and you have something analogous to that in Israel, where there's a pooling of funds uh, among philanthropoids to better serve their communities. Great, so we have two final questions, and then we'll need to move on to our second part of the meeting today. One is, can you suggest a strategy to cultivate top management interest in a merger? Often the top tire management are resistant due to job preservation, as I'm sure you know from the example. So if you can say anything about that, and I'll add on the second question, you might want to address them one after the other. What role could or should government funders pay, play in this? Wow. Well, as we said, most mergers occur either because of financial failure or one of the top management people, the CEO, president, whatever title it may have, is going to retire or leaves the job. It opens it up and, and, and people all of a sudden say, hey, two organizations, we set up two CEOs, we have one, we, there could be economies of scale. When you have two of them, it is very difficult. Uh, and there's going to be resistance. And I think uh, 
in some of the organizations we looked at, um, uh, I had one CEO say to me, fear is the greatest deter deterrent to mergers. If you can take the fear out of the collaboration, if you can take the fear, all right, one of you are gonna get the, org the job, but it's gonna be a stronger organization as a consequence. Or we can have a fa phase out, or we can have a buyout, or we can have you know, a retirement uh, annuity set up for it. You know? So there are different ways of dealing with this. But again, if you have fear in an organization, whether it's in the top or middle management or any of the employees, it, is, it hurts the merger. Government's role, government uh, in the United States, it's very interesting because you know, so much of our charity is funded by government through pass-throughs, through not-for-profits. Um, and uh, that's always a delicate role where uh, on both parties is how much conditional conditions are placed on the money that government gives that might affect the organization, or in the case of organizations that become too dependent on government, aren't they simply a, a, an extension of government rather than organizations that are pursuing their own mission or their own cause? So it's a delicate balance on both parties, on both the grantor and the grantee of how they work through the, what their relationships ought to be without doing damage to each of their causes and each of their purposes. I hope that helps. <laughs> It does. Um, I, we could continue for a long time, but we need to cut this part of the session here. You're, of course, welcome to continue and enjoy and hear our two additional guest speakers and their case studies. So sit back and enjoy this second part of the meeting. So thank you so much, friend, Professor Hader, for joining us and for taking the time to prepare and sharing the, the results of your research. It was really fascinating. Um, I'm handing it over Rewood, to you for the second part. Thank, Thank you. you. Good luck to all you and your members. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Hader and uh, Toda Sigal. Um, so in the following part, we will try uh, to implement this topic on ourselves as funders, as foundations professionals. And we will start with examining two case studies from the experience that exists here within um, JFA Network with the aim to provide you a better under understanding about do's and don'ts, potential roles, risks, tips, and lesson learned. Um, I'm happy to invite to this virtual stage, Dina Fuchs, uh, our Executive Vice President uh, of JFN. Uh, Dina, you can unmute yourself soon. Uh, with nearly 20 years working in the philanthropic community, um, before she joined the JFN, Dina was the Senior Director of St uh, Strategy and Partnerships for Avichai Foundation. In her previous role, Dina was part of the team that has led significant merger uh, prior to the closing of the, of the High Foundation. So we will hear from Dina about that. And Batya Kalush, a philanthropic advisor and the director of SVF, uh, with years of experience in the philanthropic sphere, Batya has had um, a role in the, in the initiation and the leadership of several mergers in the Israel social field. And today we will hear from her about a merger case that took place in the time she worked for the Mariah Foundation and the Foss Foundation. Um, so thank you both of to, um, that you just uh, join us. Um, after the, this panel, as time will allow, will allow us, we will um, divide into small groups to peer discussion consultation together with Dina and Batya. And over there we will have our uh, Q and A uh, with both of them. Um, so, I will start with this first one, uh, uh, question to you, Dina, and then Batya. Um, how did you get to the to the merger in the case that uh, we invite you to to show here? Um, did you try in other ways before you turned to the merger direction? It was your first choice. Okay. Um, first of all, thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Rayot. Thank you, Sigal. Um, and I really appreciated uh, the presentation before. There's so much that's the same and, and, and plenty that's different. So let's, we'll, we'll unpack it together. Um, so um, just as Ryu introduced, before I joined JFN um, a little over a year ago, I was at the Avichai Foundation for quite some time, almost 19 years. Um, and for those of you who know Avichai, operating both in the United States and in Israel, um, the foundation sunset um, in the end of um, 2019. And, um, 
it was a, an interesting time to be at a foundation sunsetting. And we actually knew about our sunset for many, many years. We announced our sunset in 2005. We had 15 years to prepare. Um, there's never enough time. But, um, but we were thinking along the lines of what a field would look like um, with a, without Avichai. Um, particularly in the United States, wh where I was working, um, because we were um, sort of the largest funders of the Jewish day school field. Um, and we were significant funders in the overnight summer camping field. And so we understood that with our leaving the, the funding community, we were leaving those fields um, it, within, you know, in a different, it's a different reality. Um, and so we spent a significant amount of time working with our key grantees supporting day schools. Um, we worked with five in particular. Um, and we supported all five of them because they all served different audiences and different needs. There was a real nuanced understanding of how the day school field operated that was um, comfortable to the how Avichai uh, ran, you know, did our funding. Um, and so we continued funding five um, organizations all serving the day school field. Um, but we recognized that when we were leaving the field, um, that context was going to shift considerably and we didn't necessarily have you know, f other funders who looked at things the same way. So the context shifted. And I think that's the question, right? The problem that we were solving was a shifting context. Um, and so we, again, I mentioned, we, we knew we were spending down starting in 2005. Um, and for almost five, maybe more than five or almost 10 years, we worked with those, um, those organizations, those grantees to think about different ways to build their capacity to be sustainable in a post Abichai era. Um, we invested in strategic plans, we investing in certain staff um, functions, predominantly around development and developing development plans. We really worked very closely with our grantees to figure out what were the capacities that they needed to be um, stronger um, and more sustainable. And we reached a point when we recognized that that wasn't, it wasn't going in the direction that we had hoped. Um, everyone put their best effort, um, but we also recognized that five organizations in one field could be difficult. Um, and we also heard from our funding colleagues and our partners in many other programs that it was not necessarily something that they wanted. There was, this was not the field that they wanted to be sustained. And so that became the answer, um, was to sit down with those five organizations. And we, um, we, we can talk about what the mechanics were and, how, and what we learned and what we did. But ultimately, those five organizations came together around a table with Avichai at the table. Um, and we, um, we merged them into a new organization um, called Prisma, which is now, that was in 2016. Prisma is um, up and operating and is the central, um, central agency for Jewish day schools today. So. Thank you, Dina and um, Batya, and then we'll move forward for the next question. Um, hello, um, I'm very happy to be with you today. Um, you know, I, I presented a couple of times in the last few months to um, JFN, and I'm very moved to be able to share my experience with you around mergers because I think to a certain extent it brings my sense of my added value in the philanthropic field. Um, and I'll explain why. Um, my own uh, kind of approach to the world is to function like a matchmaker, like a Shad Khanit. And I am always finding and looking and seeing, up because of the work that I do as a, as a philanthropic advisor, working as a program officer, as a manager of a foundation, I'm able to see from a 30,000 foot perspective things that people at the organization level sometimes can't see. So um, in the specific case that I wanna talk about, um, it was an organization that was functioning for the last, for 10 years, it had been founded by the New Israel Fund, an organization called Agenda, which was an organization that was established and it had as its mission to enable um, social change organizations in Israel to be able to um, utilize the media effectively to convey their messages and to use the media as part of the toolbox for advancing social change. And so um, Agenda worked with many different populations, with the Arab society, with Ethiopians, with um, in general, with um, social change uh, leaders in, in Israel. And um, 
uh, F, uh, in, in 2011, I opened up my email one day and I found in there a letter from the executive director of Agenda notifying me that the organization had made a decision to close, that it was, it had done an assessment of its own, um, it had done a strategic uh, assessment and determined that it's, it didn't have enough relevance as an organization which had specialized in working in traditional media at a time when the whole field of digital media was emerging. And so they had decided to close the organization altogether. So I opened up this email and I saw this and I thought, this is ridiculous. How can an executive director without consulting with any of her donor stakeholders um, make a decision of, of like that? And at the time I was working for uh, the Mariah Fund and we had been funding um, Agenda since their establishment. And I was also consulting to another foundation, the Foes Foundation, which had also been supporting parts of Agenda's work for many years. So my immediate response to that was to write to the other donors who I knew and reach out to them and ask them, did they think that this was the right thing that needed to happen? And had they spoken to the director? And um, I'll just quickly jump forward and say that there was the responses I received from fellow funders was this is disappointing if there are other options we're very open to exploring what those might be and how we could support them and um, as it happened I had recently met through just my work an organization which was in the process of being established which had emerged out of the 2011 social protests um, which was called the boulevard and the people who were leading the boulevard um, were specialists in social media and the emerging field of using um, digital media to lead social change campaigns. I immediately understood that there might be an opportunity there to sustain the mission of traditional media alongside the social media uh, relevance that the organization that this new organization had I introduced the two organizations to each other facilitated a conversation between the two of them with no intention that this would lead to a merger rather I was thinking it could be a strategic partnership some kind of just some kind of an alliance and within a month they came back to me and they said we've decided to merge and um, they we then together, they moved through a process which resulted in the, um, the existing director of Agenda, her leaving, and a merger of the people from the board of Stira with Agenda. And then just to make it very um, interesting and impactful, um, one of the other donors who had been supporting uh, the boulevard was also a leader in a third NGO that was also using digital platforms as a way of encouraging public participation and they decided to bring their organization into the to the merger so it ended up being a merger of three organizations agenda um, the boulevard and uru these three organizations who today exist as a an, an a new third entity or really fourth entity that's called anu and um, members of the boards of those three organizations now sit as one unified board. So um, that's the case story of Agenda. Thank you, Batya. And um, I must say that this will be challenging because you have a very interesting lesson learned uh, that you shared with us in the uh, previous conversation we had, both of you. Uh, but if you had to choose, um, what is the number one uh, thing that you learned from this process and you think it's right to share in this conversation? Dina. Um, okay, so um, I'm actually, um, I'm feeling a little intimidated because I have two of my team members um, from Avichai who are actually on this call. <laughs> so um, I'm going to share what I think, but I know that if I were to survey um, you know, everybody would have a different, you know, aha key takeaway. Um, I think some of them are a little integrated. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to actually pull two together that I think. Um, um, so it, it's very, very complicated. Um, and when we talk about the legalities and the finances and 
you know, governance and all those issues, that's all complicated, but that's all, I think, doable. Um, what I found to be the hardest thing um, about the merger is the human. And when, when we started the approach towards, um, you know, thinking about this, this sort of new entity, right? It was, we ended up calling it New Org for a period of time before it was named. Um, the first thing you have to think about there is mission and vision. Um, and that's really was sort of the North Star. And that's what brings everyone to the table. But once you get to the table, I think the new focus needs to be on the people around the table um, and how, um, you know, just how human the experience is. This is enormously, enormously difficult for um, those who are around the table who I know in an idealized way what mission and vision is and what the right thing to do is. But everyone has to think about their own families, their own personal career trajectories. Um, and in our case, um, the new organization had one board member, the board chair of each organization joined the new board, um, but none of the CEOs became the CEO. We hired from outside um, and each of the CEOs um, were, were given a position at the organization, but they also had staff. I mean, it was, it was very complicated. Um, and you know, from a funder perspective, being very cognizant and aware of how human the experience is and how difficult it is for people as individuals um, and leveraging in the most possible way, right? The trust and the relationships that we had built with these grantees over so many years, that was critical. Um, and so I would, I would say that's probably my number one aha home, home moment. And I, and I do remember sitting at this table and looking around at some point and actually feeling very emotional realizing we have some responsibility for all of these lives um, and how um, and how does that play out in a way that's fulfilling for them and purposeful for them and knowing that they're all going to land okay right so keeping all of that um, holding all of that at the same time when you're focused on mission and vision thank you and Batya, i will turn this question to you as well so i was actively nodding at everything that dina was saying and i i could definitely list that as my number one also but i also i want to add one other thing which is um something that uh professor Heider mentioned which is really knowing the partner knowing who you're merging with and here i think um really understanding the um ngo or ngos and what their um you know what I would say, what is their DNA? What is their vision and mission? What are their motivations, their concerns? Who are their stakeholders that are coming into this merger? Um, NGOs have their own institutional egos. They have their own reasons for wanting to maintain their own independent status. And if they're deciding to merge, there are reasons for why that might happen, which have to do with you know, as, as he mentioned, the state the status of the organization as you know being in a place of potential um, crisis, as this was the case with Agenda, where they had basically come to the realization that they were, they didn't feel like their media focus was ultimately relevant at this point, and they were not clear that they were able to fully fulfill their mission. Um, so I think really, really understanding that and respecting the, um, the process, respecting the timing that it takes, the readiness of the NGOs to be um, to go through the process and when this will take place. One of the things that I think was really um, crucial to the merger of agenda or the creation of ANU out of these three different organizations was the fact that um, it happened at a time when each organization was in a transitional point. Agenda, as I mentioned around this issue of relevance, um, the boulevard because they were really just getting started and Oru because they had just determined that although they had plenty of financial support, they lacked a demand and a constituency for the work that they were doing. So the, all of those things together were factors that I think were crucial that, um, that, and that I took away from this. Thank you, Rose. Um, but yeah, let's, let's stay with you for the next question, because I think it's just a perfect continue for what you just said. Um, from your experience or, and perspective, what can be said on the role of funder um, in the merger process? How do you see that? So I think um, uh, 
if I would say it like this in one sentence, I would say that it's the role of a funder to be able to hold the process, to contain it, to support it, but not to push it. Like I think, you know, what Donald Hader said before about in the case of bad mergers, that it was like having a shotgun or, a, you know, a gun to your head. I think that's the worst case. That's a situation where donors see from their perspective, wouldn't it be so much better if um, organization X and organization Y, which ostensibly have the same mission and the same value set and are trying to achieve the same um, uh, outcomes, if they merged and it would be so much better for the field for there not to be all this competition between them. But organizations have DNA. And I think one of the things that donors really need to be able to do is discern where a merger and a, the, the relationships that between the two organizations and the people in them would lead to a successful outcome. And the last thing I want to say, and then I, I really want to hear from Dina, is um, I think there's a role for a funder to be a supportive listener and a facilitator rather than to play a heavy hand. And um, that's part of the process, I think, of being what I called at the beginning a matchmaker mm -hmm. to understand that role. Dina, thank okay. you, Batya. Toda. Thank you, Batya. Um, so I, I would say there were probably, um, from our experience, there were three things, roles that we had, we had played. Um, one I had referenced earlier is about being, you know, an honest broker um, and recognizing that, you know, the five organizations that we brought to the table, uh, they all knew each other. They all operated in the same orbit. Um, to some extent, there were opportunities where they did do collaboration. And I was actually thinking about that when Professor Hager was speaking about, you know, sort of the, the dating and then the, I don't know, the, the stage of dating until you get married. Um, they actually had started doing um, conferences together, you know, sort of, sort of field-wide conferences, different organizations working together to do that. Um, but even still, there wasn't a lot of trust between the organizations. Um, and the relationships really were all Avichai um, centered relationships. And we really needed to serve in that honest broker role and be really good listeners um, and really, um, I would say very deep listeners and figuring out how to, to bridge the trust gaps. That was one role um, that I think was really important. Um, it was very important for us and for other funders who are thinking about this kind of work to recognize whether that's a role that needs to be played or not. Um, we also took a seat at the table, um, not just as a deep listener, right? That was one, that was one role, but there were actually three Avichai staff people who sat at each meeting. Um, we all came from a different vantage point. Um, one of our, um, Yossi Prager, who's executive director of Avichai, actually took a, a seat at the board of the new organization. Um, Susan Cardos, who um, was um, really one of the sort of masterminds of the, the whole project, sort of served as a capacity building role. Um, and I came to the table as somebody with more experience around development and communications. And I brought that to the conversation as well, because this was a field-wide conversation, right? It wasn't just uh, around a board table. Um, so that was another thing, is edit, actually dedicated human resource. Um, and then the other, the other piece is clear. I mean, it's, the, it's sort of the gorilla in the room, and it's about the funding, right? How do you actually, as a funder, make something like this happen? Um, and I'll say we, we approached it from different vantage points. You know, number one, there was actually investing in the consultant that we brought in to work with the groups. Um, but we also actually gave grants to each of the organizations who were going through the process so that they didn't have to worry about their sustainability in the interim. Um, so whether it was the, re you know, the release time for their executives and their board to be at the table and being focused on the work or whether it was to cover some of the development gaps, you know, we, we, um, we stepped up on that organizational level. And then there was on the other end, right, a commitment to support what comes out of this. Um, and so I think that, you know, from a financial resource perspective, it's, it's quite varied. Um, 
and the other thing, you know, to echo um, the presentation earlier, we brought to it a lot of patience, um, I would say, and risk. Um, I remember it was probably an 18 month process from when we decided this was the uh, sort of an avenue we wanted to take till the end. I think, you know, a very active negotiation was about a year. Um, but I remember a board meeting where we presented the concept to our board and we said, there's a 30% chance that this is going to happen. Um, but the risk of not doing it is so much greater. So we've got to give this a shot with all of the staff and financial resource that we were putting into it. So um, that's the, you know, our experience and I think can be translated in lots of Okay, I want to ask another um, last question here when we all together and then we will go to uh, the breakout rooms and then we will be able to have a Q&A together um, with, with the members that are here with us uh, and you too. Um, and the last question would be um, either one tip or uh, one takeaway or mistake or challenge moment that you want uh, to share with us from your experience and from the process that you, you were part of. Dina, okay. you can go ahead. So I, I will say, um, I think I shared my tips. So I'll, I'll talk about one of the challenges. Um, it was actually a challenge that we didn't recognize until after. Um, so there's, there's the benefit in hindsight. Um, and, and actually it's something that Professor Hager was referencing um, you know, in, his, in the challenges section of his presentation. And that's around culture. Um, and I think this is about you speaking about in terms of the DNA. Um, we did not take enough, we, we didn't take into account enough organizational cultures when we merged the, the groups. Um, we thought about individuals, right? We thought about mission and vision and we thought about the finances and we, but when it came to having everybody working together, um, it was a difficult transition for many of the staff who were not at the original table, right? In terms of the merger um, to, to integrate into a cohesive, organization. I have to imagine that's difficult anyway, but it was, um, it was clear that we did not give enough um, attention or honor enough the differences in culture. Um, and I would say I actually, part of, part of the investment that Avichai made was I was loaned to the new organization, Prisma, um, for the first three months to set up their development and communications departments. And the morale was very, very, very low. Um, and there must have been something we could have done better in this process that took into account and honored those culture shifts um, and maybe even brought in other staff to help them with that, with that transition. And um, I would say that's probably one of the lessons learned of something that we did wrong. Thank you. And Batya, quickly, and then we'll go to the, to the breakout rooms. I want to speak about also one um, challenge or i guess i would call it a challenge and that was in the post merger period when anu began to exist as an organization and what i would say is that in the negotiation process leading up to the um, merger of the organizations of the three of them there was um part of the agreement was that, that the activities and the of each of the organizations within a certain framework would become part of the new merged organization and they would continue to function and it quickly became clear that um, the new executive director um, who took over the organization had a very clear set of um, had a clear vision of what it is he wanted to achieve through the uh, through the shared organization and some of the actions and activities um, fell out and I think that um, the, I, what I learned from that is that assumptions about that everything will look the way you expect it to look at the time when you start leading your way into a merger is not going to be what it's going to look like three months, six months, a year down the road, um, and now 10 years down the road or nine years down the road. So I think, you know, managing your expectations as a funder of what it is you're going to have in the end is very important. Hey, thank you, Batya, and thank you, Dina, and we'll continue the conversation with you both uh, in the um, small group. So thank you all for joining us and participating, participating tonight or today for those of you in the other side. Um, as we said in the beginning, the merger topic was brought, uh, was brought up by, by you 
as part of your concerns for the sustainability of the resilience of the organization you support, um, especially in these challenging times. Um, it's important for us to say that this was the very first conversation that sheds a light on funders involvement within the merger process. Um, but there are definitely more elements to cover here, such as, you know, the practical elements, mergers um, in the social sector, the legal elements, the financial elements, and many more. So we invite you um, to reach out to us if we'd like to have, you know, the stage two meeting about these further aspects. Um, it will be a different conversation if it will be, you know, uh, um, in the States and uh, in Israel, but we will facilitate and enable the information and all the um, knowledge you need. So please reach out to us uh, if you want to continue and understand better the other elements um, of the mergers and collaboration conversations. So thank you all for joining us and, and for staying um, the, until this late hour for us, the Israelis. Um, and we are looking forward to see you in our next workshops. And please, uh, we encourage you to reach out and share with us your dilemmas because this topic is only here on the stage because of you. As, as much as we understand what, what you deal with, we will be able to, to enable the tools that you wish to get. So thank you all. Thank you, Batya. Thank you, Dina. Thank you, Sigal, and thank you to the fabulous Jeff and Israel team. Um, thank you. So, have a good thank night. You. Bye. Bye. Thank, thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.